Okay, I tried to rush through that. <laughs> um, I took some notes and drafted a bit, and I think if I try to not stick to my manuscript, I'll get lost, so I hope you forgive me that I uh, stick to it and I try to keep an eye on the time. So obviously, and I can't miss that out, first I would like to thank the organizers, um, Verena, Maria, and uh, Gitti. Um, once again, uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity uh, to take part in this symposium as discussant and also as participant. And of course, I would like to express my thanks to my colleagues uh, for their wonderful presentations. And also very important, I must say, uh, for the time spent together yesterday. Um, for me, as a provenance researcher who deals rather on an archival level with the objects themselves and their itineraries, uh, so to say, um, their histories, their uh, sensitive histories, uh, then with exhibition concepts and forms of representation in a strict way. Uh, for me, it was very interesting and enriching to uh, participate in this uh, symposium because obviously provenance research and I look to my colleagues uh, in the last row, does not happen um, disconnected from what is done with the results afterwards, uh, in this case in exhibitions. And obviously provenance research does not fulfill a self-purpose in a way. It, does not, it is not done because it simply happens for its own sake in a way, but to provide the basis for further um, discussion and in the case of restitution, also ne negotiations and collaborations. So um, one could say our topic today, exhibiting difficult histories and forms of representation, play an important role when dealing with provenances, especially in a colonial um, context. And to me, the term of a difficult history or the concept of a difficult history, um, you talked about it, um, refers very much to the concept of sensitive objects or sensitive provenances. And from a, let's say, German museum, but also German society perspective, I think, um, the concept of a difficult history is very much the concept of a difficult heritage, and uh, which of course influences uh, provenance researchers' work. And I would now like to try to summarize <laughs> the papers of my colleagues uh, trying to focus on the main arguments. So um, in her lecture, Engaging Histories, Envisioning Futures, Professor Coombs uh, spoke about the complexity surrounding European museums' attempts to grapple uh, with the enduring impacts of colonialism on the African continent, particularly focusing on the difficult histories theme of our symposium. And she started by analyzing the contradictory aspects inherent uh, in the curatorial strategies employed by different museums, and therefore the plundering of the Benin city of Benin city um, by British troops in 1897 was highlighted as a key moment in the historical narrative of colonialism in West Africa. And Annie then offered a comparative perspective examining how these strategies employed by uh, European museums stack up against initiatives originating from museums in Africa by acknowledging the diverse efforts made by both national and community-run um, organizations to reshape the understanding of historical narratives, underscoring the agency to seek uh, to assert in the discourse. Um, I think one very important aspect Annie shed light on was the public images that museums uh, create, and I also found her remarks on uh, multivocality very helpful. And um, as she said, the key element of this thought is to acknowledge um, different kinds of uh, agencies. And by referring to the example of the Wallace uh, collection, Annie highlighted the role of museums as a space that uh, can't be reclaimed in a way, and uh, probably we can talk about this later on a bit if there's <laughs> some time. And I must say the other examples were also very helpful in order to understand the inconsistencies of how different implications of globalization are represented in uh, museums. And I would also like to come back to the idea of imperialistic tragedy um, of plunder, dispersal, and representation in alien environments, as you uh, formulated it. And because here I also see 
uh, connecting point to provenance research in a way and how this can be met in exhibitions. Um, so to conclude, and I don't have an answer to this, and uh, probably there is not a final one available, taking a closer look at uh, histories of violence versus um, history on an art history level of meaning, I wonder how to integrate um, both perspectives. So this is the first part. So now um, Stefan's lecture offered a comprehensive examination of the Bannon bronzes and their representation in two different museum exhibitions, delving into the complex issues surrounding restitution, colonialism, and historical injustice. Um, Stefan began by highlighting the significance of the Bannon bronzes as both icons of African art and symbols of colonial plunder, uh, sparking debates over the restitution of colonial era loot. And then he introduced the central argument uh, that the restitution of such artifacts is not merely about legal ownership, but also about addressing historical wrongs and their present day legacies, including global inequalities and um, structural racism. Stefan then shifted to the broader question of how history is represented beyond a uh, mere ownership focusing on the narratives surrounding the Bannon bronzes and the biographies. He argued that while much of the debate centers on ownership, it is essential to consider whose pasts are highlighted or silenced in the process of narrating history uh, through these artifacts. In his presentation, um, he then proceeded to analyze the exhibitions at the British Museum and the National Museum in Benin City, examining how they handle difficult heritage. And he critiques that the tendency of museums to neutralize difficult heritage by focusing on the heritage of others while downplaying or omitting their own role in um, historical injustices. Um, and specifically, Stefan explored how topics such as uh, scientific racism, colonial looting, human sacrifice, slavery and gender um, hierarchies are portrayed in museum displays. They um, highlight uh, discrepancies in how these topics are addressed, um, pointing out instances where difficult truths are glossed over or misrepresented. Um, and furthermore, the lecture discussed the, uh, the issue of looting um, and colonialism, emphasizing uh, differences in how the events of uh, 1897 are depicted at the BM and the uh, um, museum in Be uh, Benin City. And um, interesting, I, I found that very interesting that you referred to um, current um, changes or recent changes in the British Museum's narrative, which uh, now acknowledges colonial uh, violence and looting more explicitly, um, possibly influenced by contemporary social mo uh, movements such as um, Black Lives Matter. Um, in order of time, uh, <laughs> um, I hope you forgive me. I have uh, some more thoughts, but I'll jump to the conclusion uh, just to, um, so that we have some more time to um, um, discuss later on. Um, You also talked about sensitive subjects like, I mean, I already mentioned it, human sacrifice and uh, enslavement of people, examining how these are interpreted and presented differently. I already mentioned that. And um, moreover, you discussed uh, class perspectives and inequalities inherent in colonial encounters using examples such as um, uh, compensation for British uh, officers versus the lack of um, compensation for uh, local carriers killed during the Benin ma massacre. And in conclusion, in your lecture, you underscore the, the importance of adopting an intersectional approach, uh, approach to representing difficult pasts, I would say. Uh, one that acknowledges the intertwined legacies of colonialism, racism, um, classism, and sexism. And um, you um, advocate for resisting simplified accounts of history. Uh, and striving to understand its complexity while remaining focused on addressing um, ongoing injustices. So that's... So, um... Koki. 
I really try to rush through it. Um, in your paper, indigenous exhibition of Benin cultural objects in reviewing the display of Benin bronzes in Nigeria, Europe, and America, um, you describe the relationship between cultural objects, museums, and attitudes in the society as a complex and evolving one, and you offer a case study uh, of the National Museum in Benin uh, City. At its core, this uh, relationship uh, you, you talked about reflects the universal human inclination to collect, uh, preserve, and display objects of cultural significance, and uh, which serve as tangible expressions of identity and heritage. These artifacts, beyond their uh, aesthetic appeal, one could say, often hold functional, uh, ritual, and uh, very important um, commemorative uh, value within their respective uh, societies. And uh, you explained that in the pre-colonial Benin, uh, this inclination found expression through a unique craft guild system that not only facilitated the production and standardization of cultural artifacts, but also played a vital role in ma maintaining artistic traditions. However, uh, Koki also explained that the arrival of colonial powers introduced formal museum institutions, disrupting traditional preservation practices and imposing Western exhibition styles uh, that often detached artifacts from their original um, cultural contexts. Nigerian uh, museums, including the National Museum in Benin City, face uh, numerous challenges, uh, including low local patronage and a perception of uh, foreigners among um, potential visitors. And to address these issues, uh, there is a growing call for African-oriented museums that prioritize local cultures and engage diverse audiences through dynamic culturally and immersive experiences, I think you called it. And um, this reimagining involves adopting alternative exhibition methods that draw inspiration from indigenous practices, fostering a deeper contextual understanding of the objects on display. And in this context, you explore the indigenous exhibition and display methods of Benin objects, contrasted and, and contrasting them with uh, conventional museum practices. And you highlighted the traditional arrangements of objects within the palace. Um, and family altars emphasizing the order and significance attributed to each uh, item. And by integrating these indigenous methods with modern exhibition practices, museums can uh, create uh, more engaging and culturally relevant experiences for visitors contextualizing objects within their social and cultural significance. And we also uh, heard that language plays an important a crucial role in a museum displays uh, with Koki advocating for the use of ethical and equitable language uh, that respects the cultural contexts of the objects and their source uh, communities and uh, by reframing outdated narrative and avoiding derogatory terms museums can contribute uh, to a more respectful and accurate representation of uh, indigenous cultures. In conclusion, Koki emphasized that um, she uh, emphasized the importance of museums um, entertaining, educating, and engaging uh, visitors um, through innovate, innovative um, exhibition strategies that incorporate both indigenous and conventional approaches, and um, by prioritizing the local context and cultural significance of objects, uh, you said museums can foster a deeper um, appreciation and understanding of diverse cultures while making exhibitions more um, accessible and engaging to a broader audience. After having started with a quote by Aimé Césaire and um, making uh, universities and museums as Eurocentric, and by marking universities and museums as Eurocentric places of exclusion, Tukufu Suberi um, underlined the importance uh, of the role of the African diaspora, and at the same time, um, Professor Suberi stated that museums as repositories of cultural artifacts often uphold narratives of colonial violence by displaying objects acquired through exploitation and extraction. And 
I don't think you can decolonize the museum itself, but you can decolonize the narratives in the museum, he said. And I tend to agree to that statement very much. Uh, but at the same time, it's obviously uh, difficult to achieve that, right? Um, so <laughs> um, that's something um, I'm still um, thinking about. And artifacts kept in museums uh, torn from their original context represent a painful history, obviously um, a history of displacement and dehumanization inflicted upon uh, people from the African continent. And here, as a provenance researcher, I see a strong connection to my work or um, provenance research in general, trying to investigate uh, histories of translocations. And like Stefan emphasized in his presentation, Tukufu claimed that um, the foundational collections in museums primarily built during periods of colonialism and the enslavement of African people serve to justify these violent acts under the guise of academic pursuit. And um, by introducing a concept of how the provenance of an object is shaped institutionally, to my mind, Tukufu also questioned the concept of provenance it itself. And furthermore, he claimed that the inclusion of African material culture in museums further solidifies the partition, uh, partition sorry, of um, Africa um, and its diaspora, reinforcing narratives of superiority and inferiority. Uh, he stated that um, the notion of decolonization extends beyond mere restitution and reorganization of museum collections and that a broader interrogation of power structures and epistemological frameworks that underpin these institutions is necessary. And by presenting a case study of Benin objects at the Penn Museum, you showed that one way of changing the narrative uh, by talking about how the items were taken from a sacred place, um, as you said, and how they became part of the museum presentation and how their provenance becomes part of their meaning, which I found very interesting. And in essence, one could probably say that the main argument was that decolonizing museums requires a holistic um, re-evaluation -evalu of their practices and ideologies, acknowledging the, interconnect the interconnectedness of knowledge production, power dynamics, and the liberation of marginalized uh, communities. So that was my quick rush. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie, for your amazing wrap-up, uh, not only in time, but in content. So I think um, we've got basically all the arguments um, that have been developed today. So thank you once again very much. And so as we are running late and it's almost six o'clock, I would take the last questions now. I saw Anna was, had a question and I think there was one online and if there are very urgent questions you can ask them now otherwise i would propose that we continue the uh, discussion more informally after the uh, event okay anna do you want to go ahead with your question yeah, yeah thank you i had several questions but now i, I think i'm asking another one <laughs> um so um as uh, it, it especially is for um, um, Tukufu Zuberi, and yeah. ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was wondering because um, I don't know much about American uh, museums on African art, but um, they seem to be also um, came into being also as or the way they are today as as part of the um, civil rights movements and are also seen as spaces of empowerment and. Um, I'm asking this also because German museums very, very recently discovered that um, the diaspora might be an audience and, and even a, a collaborator for the museums. And, and before they have been mainly uh, been seen as, as intruders also in a way. Um, and, and I'm wondering because when I see now like here in this place when there are um, projects of collaboration it's always presented as um, a big success story. Um, but as far as I know, there is also a lot of dissent. And, and, um, and you know, to uh, exhibit um, the issues that you tackled um, is also something that white German people find discomforting. And I'm wondering how museums can also be 
not only spaces that welcome people, um, but also be spaces of discomfort and dissent and, um, and debate and um, how to get away from, uh, yeah, from being always um, a story of success. Um, no, I'll get you the microphone. Thank you for the question. What I was trying to suggest is that actually it didn't start with the Black Lives Matter movement. It didn't start with the Civil Rights Movement. It didn't even start with what we typically call the African Independence Movement. I could have talked about those movements as having an impact on this, but that really the roots of it are in people rejecting the human zoos at museums. Du Bois and several other African diaspora populations went to the Paris exhibit in 1900 and presented counter exhibits. So many counter exhibits were presented at these big international fairs. Now, it, you gotta remember that a lot of the museums, their original collections come from these royal collections, come from these uh, cabinets of curiosity, comes from these donations and collaborations of very, in, within very elite circles. Outside of those circles were people who were protesting against the creation of those circles. But can you imagine the Pan-African Congress in London, the Pan-African Congress in uh, Paris, they're delivering messages to the League of Nations, to the governments of Britain, France, and Germany about the need to change the narrative about who they were and to give them basic human rights. So in some fundamental way, we do great damage to their memory when we don't remember that they were raising these questions. They organized exhibits at these places. They organized wherever they could, they organized exhibits. It's only recently that they begin to create counter institutions or to engage in the museums that are scattered around the world and where they have political space or place to engage in that. And sometimes, you know, like the muse Ethnographic Museum in, in the Netherlands hired an individual from Jamaica to come and be the head ethnographer as they try to address the decolonization in their museums, you know. So I'm saying that it is a, at this moment, is an international problem that we can address if we can open our minds and hearts to think beyond where we are and to think beyond the narrative and the history that we get to get where we are. So I'm just suggesting that to you. Some, some people say that African studies, for example, in the United States started with an individual called Hertzovitz and that it started at Northwestern University. And they ignore almost 100 years of research on Africa, protests for Africa in the United States by the African diaspora. And they care not to remember that because they have a different agenda. And I'm just saying we ought to check our agendas for what they are and try to recorrect them for how and where we can go. I hope that addressed your question. Okay, thank you very much. So we have one more online. Yes, so there is one question in the chat which is more on an organizational level. Will the slides be accessible for uh, the attendees. Uh, to be honest, we didn't ask our guests yet, so we'll have to discuss that. Um, but the whole event has been recorded and that will be available one way or another soon. Um, and then there is one last question by Ignacio Campino, although I'm not entirely sure whether that was the old question or whether it's a new one. If you have a question, Mr. Campino, please open your microphone. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a mistake. Sorry. All right, I no worries. <laughs> oh, okay. So, are there more questions? Yeah, one more? Yeah, because it's a question for you. Since mm -hmm. at the beginning you mentioned in the introduction that a third of the, the new bronzes are now being like borrowed to the Humboldt Museum, but mm -hmm. that they are actually 
now under the ownership. Could you explain that again? Because I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so um, when the ownership um, of the objects was transferred to Nigeria in uh, 2022, um, it was mutually agreed with the Nigerian partners that um, like the ownership, I mean, is transferred to Nigeria, but one third of the Berlin collection or the, yeah, the Berlin collection um, is going to be uh, in Berlin for another 10 years, loaned for 10 years um, for different exhibitions, yeah. Okay, and the last question is, it was, do you, are you an insider in this process? Do you know if this was Nigerian regulation or German regulation? Um, I am the scientific um, part of the whole process, so um, the political decisions are taken by the directors and by, I mean, maybe our director can, can say more uh, on this process of restitution. This is not the part of the curators. Would you want me to pass you the microphone? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just, just talking about this, this process, I mentioned this in the beginning already. Um, the process of restitution and discussion was on a partnership level. It was not a straight decision from our side. Our partners from Nigeria suggested that they want to be present here in the Humboldt Forum. And we discussed what we need for this. And together with Abatijani, we discussed what kind of objects we need for the ten, next 10 years to be present here and to be exhibited. And this was a decision on the Nigerian side. And we just had this uh, strategy, 40 to 50 objects in the exhibition at one time, and for 10 years he wanted to change it three times. This was, it was exactly what Abba Tijani also suggested, and this was the, um, the contract then, in this way, and this is what we are going to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, if there are no more questions, I would like to um, ask my fellow colleagues, Maria and Kitty, to come to the stage. And, yeah, thanking you all for your participation, uh, all the people that are here physically and those who are here with us online, internationally. So, very, very... Um, uh, a very big thank you to all of you having participated in these um, yeah, fruitful discussions, which are for me personally, or I think I can talk for us, are very helpful also to further develop the um, exhibition, and I'm sure we will stay in touch for this. Um, a special thanks uh, to our speakers, of course. <clears throat> providing us with their thoughts and um, yeah, I hope we stay in touch and as we said earlier, we had a really excellent day yesterday together, also researching together in the storage facilities, going to the exhibitions and this was actually one of our aims also to interconnect academia and museum today and like having also the advantages of um, uh, academic results and integrate them into the museum uh, exhibition. Maybe I'll just pass on. Well, I don't think there's anything mm -hmm. to add to that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, to the guests and also to the people here in the room who spent the whole day with us. I know it's late and it's Friday. So I'd say uh, we finish here, right? Kitty, do you want to have the last word? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We had a wonderful time, I think, as, as this curatorial team uh, sort of worked out all of the logistics of getting together. We were dreaming of lively conversations, and I think that's exactly what we got. Um, I uh, was re really impressed with the talks and the different perspectives, and I think there's a lot of food of for thought for us uh, in terms of how to move forward because one of our questions is always what is our next step. The um, exhibition I think was never meant to be closed at this point uh, but to be a, a process oriented um, exhibition that you know so, so these further questions and answers that we've received today will then be very helpful as Verena and Maria in particular could move forward with this project. Thank you so much for your presence. Um, 
we uh, really appreciate <laughs> your feedback. great last words. <laughs> And, and just lastly, not to forget to invite you to tomorrow's opening of the uh, two new showcases. It takes place at 3 p.m. A meeting point is on the second floor um, at the um, Africa exhibitions. And um, it's in German, so it's a little bit exclusive. We know that, but it's for a broad German public. Um, at the moment to open it and yeah so uh, but we'll have also uh, guided tours in english soon okay thank you very much once again and have a nice evening <laughs>